Right, folks, I invite you to join with me and get your Bibles out and look at John chapter 12, verse 1 through to 19. That's our reading this morning, John chapter 12, verse 1 through to 19. It is printed on your brochure. You can have a look at it there with us. And for you folk that are joining with us online, good to have some of you that are looking at this after the event it is also good to have you join with us and as we can share god's word with you today commonly known as palm sunday so we're going to be looking at john chapter 12 as we consider these events that took place the week before christ jesus was crucified in that week running up to that so read along with me john chapter 12 verse 1 Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which he had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and uh, Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he had cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they these things were written of him, and that he had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. And as we consider this reading this morning, as we go through this reading in John and look at the various cross references we will look at, we pray that you would teach us what you would have us to know through your word, through the Holy Spirit living in within each and every one of us. May we take your word, read it, believe it, trust it, and have it effectually work. We give you thanks. We give you praise by Christ Jesus. Amen. So, folks, I want to share with you this message, and I've taken it from John chapter 12, verse 1 through, and, and not just picked up where often folks start and talk about the, the spreading of the palm leaves and so forth, but I want you to get and understand what was really happening. You know, sometimes we can do so many different things and reenact so much and, you know, come with the palm leaves and think of all that, that we miss the real essence of what has actually been happening here. And I, I want to just make sure that we understand this. The day before Palm Sunday, there are things happening that we need to get and understand that the enemy of your soul and the enemy of Christ, Satan, was not happy with. And through the religious leaders of the day was trying to nullify. But when you look at this and you actually go back in, in, in the scriptures now and you see what Christ had accomplished and what is recorded here, right there sitting with Christ at this table. Notice verse 1 of chapter 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Now, Bethany is about five and a half kilometers from Jerusalem. Okay, so he's going to go into Jerusalem. He's about five and a half kilometers from Jerusalem. They walked where they went. <laughs> they wrote on donkey. Okay, you mean five and a half k's? That's just down the road. Now, hold on a minute. It's, 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 a, it's a way, and it's 
yeah, we're quite spoiled today. We don't fully un grasp and understand some of these things. But anyway, five and a half kilo kilometers from Jerusalem. And he says, but notice the, the, what, the, what the scriptures say, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Not okay. The Lord Jesus Christ is fixing to go to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem because he knows he's going to be crucified. Don't think that the Lord Jesus Christ did not know what was coming his way. I mean, before Christ left the portals of heaven, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit purposed in their heart before creation, before they even created the heaven and the earth, they knew and purposed the plan that was going to happen. So you think about this for a moment. Christ, who's part of creation, looks at this and knows what he's about to be involved in with the creation. He's going to have to come and die for. And we ask, I wonder if God loves me. Really? <laughs> Just think about that for a moment. He knew what he, he knew what was eventually going to, uh, to happen to him. And here Christ now, he's taken on physical form. He's come into the world, fully God, fully man. He's come in and he's taken on physical form. And as he's taken on this physical form, he's lived on earth. 30 years he has been on earth waiting for his ministry to start. Why, why would he wait 30 years? I mean, at the age of 12, if you go back, you look at the age of 12, he had the religious leaders in awe with his knowledge and his understanding. So why didn't he start his ministry earlier? Well, because he came to fulfill the, the law. And what did the Jewish law require? That a man needed to be 30 years old to be a priest. And so because he needed to be 30 years old to be a priest, Christ came and fulfilled that law. So he lives a perfect life, fully man, fully God, and he waits till he's 30 years old to start his ministry. Why? So that he can fulfill the role as a priest and not break the law. I, you, you know, we look at that. Hang on. Cry. Folks, do you understand? There are 613 laws and statutes that the nation of Israel were given. There's only one person that fulfilled that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, sometimes we can come and we can look and say, oh, you know, I'm not like that person. Oh, I'm not like that person. I don't do that. I don't do that. <laughs> and I can just imagine the Lord's going to say, mm, have, you, have you seen the other laws? <laughs> that I've got in place? The scripture says all have sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I'm sorry, folks, you here in the hall, online, watching this after the end, me, everybody, the scriptures declare to be sinners. Romans 3.23. But the good news is, because we're all sinners, Romans 3.24 says, we are justified through our faith in Christ. So if we've trusted what Christ accomplished on the cross at Calvary, which we're going to look at now, this leading up, and then next week, Sunday, we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish the thought that I'm wanting to share with you today. If we believe and trust that, the word of God says, you have been declared righteous. That God looks at you through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as righteous. So here's the Lord. He's, he's coming. He knows he's going to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to die on the cross at Calvary. But he's also been telling his disciples, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. Do you know that the disciples didn't understand that the scripture declares it? We'll look at that now. They didn't fully grasp and understand. Now, you and I have the benefit of looking back. And looking back at the scriptures and seeing all of this and say, oh, we can see how this happened. Why didn't the disciples see it? Well, I can tell you now, if we were there, we wouldn't have seen it either. And the world today is in such darkness. Folks, you know, there are so many people that do not know about the Lord Jesus Christ. They haven't even heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. That if you ask them, they, they wouldn't even know. And I'm talking in first world countries. And so what the Lord is doing here is he is putting on display his power. Look at this for a moment. Just don't miss this. You know, in all the waving of the, yeah, the palm trees, I mean, I mean, no disrespect, but for everybody that's going around today, Sunday, waving palm trees, don't miss this point. Verse 1 of chapter 12, Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And what is he doing? 
Verse 2, there they made a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So the Lord is saying, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. And just so you don't misunderstand what I'm talking about, yes, it's Lazarus at supper with me. Here's my evidence. Not so that I can be just, you know, try and sort of justify myself, but so that you can have a physical evidence of what I'm going to say. <laughs> and remember, when Lazarus had died, he'd been dead more than three days. Why? Because when he got to the tomb, they said, he stinketh. <laughs> he'd started to decompose. So, you know, this wasn't a the fact that, oh, Lazarus was just dead, and, and then the Lord sort of, oh, he'd been lying there unconscious, and we, we took, no, no, his body had been to he had already been had started to decompose the power that the lord jesus christ had was to raise up the dead but to give life to something that was completely dead so now lazarus is sitting there now and you say well okay so what's the meaning of that let's read on then took mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of ointment. So, so Mary is there, she, she's anointing Jesus' feet. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, well, by the way, Judas was the treasurer. Jesus made Judas the treasurer. Now, there's a song, The Great Pretender. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it to you. <laughs> My mind, th th this is the way I look at it. Judas was the greatest hoodwinker and pretender because he was part of the 12 but he had another plan he had another plan all along and jesus knew do you think jesus didn't know do you think the lord jesus christ didn't know that he was going to swindle the money and what did christ do he put him in charge of the money so well okay i know what you're going to do so there you go folks you understand that when you look at the world today and you try and fathom what's going on and why we have all the corruption and stuff happening in the world that's the pride of man that's the brokenness of man and here judas and he comes now, now he comes and he, you can just imagine with this mindset and he says verse five why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor he knows the value of that ointment you know, you know you, can you imagine? How did he know the value? You thought about that for a moment. Don't miss this. How did he know the? He saw that. He saw that. Mm, okay. I wonder how much that's worth. You think about that. Folks, don't let the physical, financial things of this world grip you. We need it. We need to be wise with what we have. We need to give thanks if we have what we have. And if we don't have what we would like to have, the word of God says nothing can separate us from the love of God. But we've got to be so careful that we don't get sucked into this. And there Judas was, <laughs> and he says, 300 pence. By the way, 300 pence? You know what that was in, in, in that amount of money that, that time? It was 10 months wages of an average worker. We're talking about a lot of money, folks. okay? Judas knew that. Look at the answer. This he said, not that he cared for the poor. Hello. The Holy Spirit bringing John to write this <laughs> knew that was not the heart of Judas. The heart is deceitful. The heart of a lost man, mankind, is deceitful, folks. We need to have renewed hearts, and we get that through our faith in Christ Jesus and God the Holy Spirit entering in and making us a new creature, the Bible says. But because, notice, he was a thief and had the bag, that's the money purse, of all of the 12, by the way, and bear what was put there. That word bear means he'd already taken, he, he was helping himself, Okay. Think about this for a moment. This is the day before Palm Sunday. Christ is sitting there. 
Judas is there. He's on display. The, the Lord Jesus Christ has put him on display so that you can see physically what, I'm going, what I've t- told you I can do. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day, notice, of my bearing hath she kept this. Christ knew what was happening, folks. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ knew what he was going to face. Can you imagine? Can you? Let me just put this into a personal context. And, and, and really, honestly and truly, my operation that, that I had pales into insignificance to what many of you have, have faced, okay? But leading up to that, I was due to go in on the Tuesday. And uh, they then phoned me to say, no, 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 look, you can't go in because there's now a problem because the cornea couldn't be imported. It, it, it was coming from America because there was a public holiday and so forth, and there were complications. So we're going to have to push your... Um, your operation out to the Thursday. You, 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 you know, I mean, I, I had to go th- I'm, in my in my mind, in my in my flesh. I had to go through this whole like, okay, I've built myself up to, to look at this and prepare myself for this. Another two days. What did I do? Well, I just looked at the scriptures, and I had scriptures that I was looking at and saying, you know what, Ed? Just two days on. Okay. Now I look back, and it's like more than two weeks. And I'm like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> but I'm telling you. There, there, were some, there were some things, thoughts that I was going through. And, that, and I knew I was, I was in good hands. I knew that the doctor was, I, I knew that I was going to be uh, put out and I wasn't going to feel any pain. And yes, I'd have a, a pain afterwards. I knew that it was coming. But you imagine and think for a moment what the Lord knew he was going to go through. And folks, we have folks throughout the world right now, they start to reenact the crucifixion of the Lord, and they flay themselves, you know, beat themselves, and they then they want to crucify themselves. I don't, I'm probably going to get into trouble for what I'm going to say now, but honestly, that's a mockery. Really? That is a mockery. For those folks to do that is a mockery. Because there is no way that any human being can reenact what the Lord Jesus Christ went through 2,000 years ago for you and I. You can, you can possibly bring the physical pain onto a person, but you can never, ever, ever, ever duplicate the spiritual pain and emotional pain that our Lord and Savior went through. He died on that cross to pay for the sin of mankind. He hung on that cross and for three hours, and we'll look at that next next week, for three hours, the word of God says there was darkness and the sun was darkened. There was physical darkness, but there was spiritual darkness. Do you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ for those three hours hung there completely alone and taking the punishment and and bearing the the, punishment spiritual suffering for your sin and mine. We could never, ever, ever reenact that. So we need to have that mindset this morning and understand that what Christ accomplished for us and as we lead into this week, that we focus on that and we think on that and we think, this is what my Lord and Savior did for me. And you focus on the scriptures and you focus and you want to know, does God love you? You want to know through circumstances in life, what you're facing. Is there a God who loves me? You focus on that. And there Christ, he's, he's sitting, he's got Lazarus there. And then he's got the thief that is going to betray him with him. I hope, I hope I'm, this is not your normal waving a palm Sunday, right? Think about that. Then he says in verse 8, for the poor always ye have with you. Christ was not nullifying helping the poor, folks. He's saying you're always going to have the poor with you. But this specific event, what is happening here, what Mary is doing to me now, this spike nod is for my bearing. She's doing this. And there's so much more we can share with you, but time won't allow us to do that right now. But we need to understand and, 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 and the Bible says the whole house was full with the aroma. You can be reminded of what was happening. 
Look at verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Do you understand that? <laughs> really? He's there. Yes. Christ put him on display. But the chief priests, now listen to this. The chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Do you understand that? I, I don't know if you've ever seen that or, or recognized that. There the Lord is. He's preparing to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And guess what these religious leaders of the day want to do? They want to put Lazarus to death. Why? Because he's put on display what he's able to do. And, they, and they're thinking, we better put this dude to death. Because we can't have him there because the people are going to believe that what Jesus is saying is the truth. So let, let, let's, let's get rid of him. Now, Lazarus did die. Okay. Lazarus was raised by the Lord Jesus Christ. He did die again. Because he, he's going to be raised again. The word of God says, we're going we're gonna to get renewed bodies. But at that point in time, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing. You understand that every time the Lord Jesus Christ performed a miracle, it was a teaching opportunity. So when he raised Lazarus, he was, he was teaching physically, visually displaying what his power was so that the nation of Israel, whom he had come to save, could see because he came to save the nation of Israel. And if they had heeded what he had said, they were then going to take the message of salvation out to the whole world. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Why? Because that reason by of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, okay, now here we get to Palm Sunday. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Well, now we can see. The people that had this evidence, it was there. Folks had seen the miracles. They were coming saying, this is who he is. The religious leaders are getting ever so much more against the Lord. And then verse 14, and Jesus, when he had found a, a young ass and sat thereon, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. By the way, that, that, that's a reference to Zechariah 9.9. 9. Keep your hand there, John. I'll just go with you. There's Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. I'll just read it. This is John quoting from the book of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus Christ, think about this for a moment. Jesus knows the scripture he must fulfill. Okay, he's... He knows what's going to happen, and he knows this is this, and that's why he rides on a donkey. That's why he comes in, not on a white horse, uh, you know, coming leading this, this, this army. Christ is coming back, folks, and when he comes back, he's coming back to take vengeance. But the first time he came, he came to die on the cross. He came in meekness. Meekness is not weakness. He came in, in, in fulfilling that. Verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first. You, you, you see that? Don't miss that scripture. The disciples didn't understand everything that was happening. He'd been teaching them. And they were like, oh, we don't fully understand this. But notice, these things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they these things that were written of him and they that had done these things unto him. The people therefore was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. They reported about this. For this cause, the people also met him for they had heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said unto among themselves, perceive ye how he prevailed nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Everyone's listening to him. What happened? Well, we know that the religious leaders moved the people against the Lord, that they got to the point where they cried, away with him and release unto us Barabbas, who was a robber and a murderer, by the way. That's what we need to have in mind as we gather this Sunday and as we look forward to the week and until we can meet again next Sunday. That, that's, what we, that's what I want you to focus on. That's what I want you to remember. That's, that's, 
the giving of thanks. You don't have to walk out of your all morbid this morning saying, oh, you can look back and say, you know what? That is what happened. I can see the power of that. I can see. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss the power of that. I don't want to miss and, and, and not bear record of these things. That's the God who loves you. Let's look at some other scripture this morning. How's our time? Oh, can we get in there? John chapter 14. You're in John 12, right? Just go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And I've just picked a couple of verses here for us just to look at. John chapter 14. The Lord Jesus Christ said, yeah, and I'm going to just jump in right at verse six for, for time's sake, but I, I encourage you to read the rest of John chapter 14. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, Jesus says, ye should have known my Father also. Jesus, you see me, you see my Father. God the Father is spirit. When you saw the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the physical manifestation of the, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Now, there's a verse I want to take you to that's not in your notes. So you can just write down in your notes, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. But I want to just take you there. Paul, the apostle, writing to the church at Colossae. This is, this is what he refers to here. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Just jot that down and you can go and have a look at it afterwards. If you would like, um, Colossians 2, verse 9 and 10. For in him, now this is Paul the Apostle writing. For in him, that's who, in Christ, notice, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye... Word, the old English word ye there is the group, the Colossian believers, and by implication, you and I today as members of the church, the body of Christ as Christians, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. But the verse I want you to get is verse 9 there. It says, in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When, when you saw Christ Jesus, you saw God on display. You saw God the Father, God the Holy Spirit on display. By the way, when the we'll pick up on this next week, but who was involved in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? It was God the Father. It was God the Holy Spirit. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ physically, his body succumbed and, 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 and he physically died. But the Lord Jesus Christ did not die. He was not out there saying, oh, Lord, my father say he was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three members of the Godhead were, were involved in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All three, the members of the Godhead, were involved in creation. When the Bible says God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, who was that? That was the Lord Jesus Christ in his physical, in a manifestation before he took on human form, physical form. But the point I want you to see is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are always involved. When the Lord Jesus Christ said, my Father sent me to do his work, the Lord Jesus Christ was doing the work of his Father, but he was fully God. And yet the, God's word says he didn't think it robbery that he came to take on physical form. You follow that? The Bible says he was a little lower than the angels. Now, what does that mean? I mean, did the angels tell Jesus what to do? No, he was a little lower than the angels because Jesus Christ needed to take on physical form that could die. The angels don't have a physical form that could die. That's why he was made a little lower than the angels when he took on physical form. We mustn't miss that and miss the fact that you have a God who was not taken by surprise by Judas. Taken by surprise by those that came on that, that week and, and arrested Christ and crucified him. He was not surprised by that. So when the Lord is preparing all of these things, he's, he's still teaching. <laughs> he's, he's still giving truth. Okay, go back with me to John 17, 17. John 17, 17. I should have told you to keep your hand in, John, but I didn't myself. But John 17, 17.
I'm just going to jump in right here, verse 17. Uh, let's look at verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. That word sanctify means make holy, holy through thy word. What does the word of God say? Go with me to John 1. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, capital W. Who's that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, and the word, capital W, was with God. And the word, notice, was God. Many other versions of scripture will say was a God. Folks, Jesus wasn't a God. Christ was God. Don't miss that. If your Bible says a God, scratch out a. <laughs> okay. Better yet, use a KJ Bi King James Bible, and you'll get the truth of what you need to get in your language of English. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, notice, were made by him. Who's the him? Christ. And without him was not anything made. You understand that? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all present at creation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all present at the resurrection. Nothing was done without the other. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when Jesus says sanctifying by their word, by Jesus was the word the physical manifestation of the word. He spoke the word when he was on. Today, what, what do we have today? We have the written word. We have the preserved written word. And when Jesus now says, sanctify them through thy word, how, how are we going to be made separate? We know and understand that the scriptures say our faith in Christ makes us anew. We, we are renewed in Christ Jesus. We have, we have been declared righteous. But now we save. Now what do we do? Well, now we need to read and study God's word so that we can be empowered to live life on a daily basis. Many folks say to me, Aiden, teach us how to live. Can I tell you, I've got enough trouble just trying to live myself. <laughs> I don't know your individual circumstances, but I do know this. If I teach you God's word, if you take God's word and you study God's word and you read God's word, it's going to teach you how to be and how to live in your circumstances. You follow that? God gives us freedom of choice, folks. God's not worried if you decide to buy a car. I've said this to you how many times? If you decide, oh, I'm going to buy a car. Lord, should I buy a pink one, green one? Uh, should I buy this car, that car? What should? God says, that's your choice, but be wise in your decision. Look at your finances. Look at your circumstances. And buy the vehicle that you can afford. You've got freedom of choice to do that. God is interested in your heart. He's interested in you looking and understanding and saying, I need to take his word and I need to know how is it that I live in this, this present world that I'm living in. And if you, if you take the writings of the Apostle Paul, particularly starting the book of Romans, and you read the book of Romans, the book of Romans is a beautiful, basic book of the doctrine that you need. If you can get the book of Romans down and you can read that through a number of times, in there, in the book of Romans, folks, you will find how you can face the challenges of this life that we live in today. I mean, the whole Bible is important, but I'm, I'm saying if you want specific, Romans is going to give you the answer. 16 chapters in the book of Romans. If you read that through, it will help you. It will guide you. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews, this book is specifically written to the nation of Israel. It is a book that the nation of Israel are going to need to, to have the little flock, the little group of believers. Once the church, the body of Christ is taken out in the rapture, the catching away. Behind me is this sign. Um, if you haven't seen it before, we use this and we have it. And I sometimes point to it. We have it online. It comes from America and we have it in, in, in print as well. And it, and it just brings to a point that we live in this age now, this, this yellow part that is there, for 2,000 years, we have lived in a period of time known as the age of God's grace. Where the scriptures, the prophetic scriptures declared God was coming to take vengeance and wrath. And if you look in the book of Acts, chapter 9, when God... He's Paul, the apostle, who was Saul, a Hebrew, going around persecuting the church of God. He converts him, and rather than coming to pour out his wrath, he delays his wrath and has been delayed for, for 2,000 years. 
And every day that we have is a day and an opportunity that we have to know the grace of God and to share that message and have more people come to that understanding. But one day, the time is going to come when the Lord is going to take us out, the church, the body of Christ. We're going to leave this broken world. Those have gone on before us. They've left this broken world already. You and I will then leave. And once that happens, then the period of time known as the, the 70th week of Daniel, the, the, the period of, of tribulation is going to come to this world. You know, we've got so much happening in the world right now with wars and things happening. And a lot of folks have asked me, and I'll just make mention again, you know, what's happening in Ukraine and in Europe. Is that part of Bible prophecy? The quick answer is no. How do I know that? Well, the scriptures teach me that. And the scriptures teach that you cannot have prophecy unfolding when you have the age of grace. You can't, we've, been, we've been slotted into this period. What's happening in, in Europe at the moment is the brokenness of man. Is the greed of mankind. There are going to be wars that are going to be fought when we leave this broken world. That, that war is going to pale into insignificance. Now, what is happening there is absolutely tragic. And we pray for those folk. And we pray for the situation there. But that's not part of Bible prophecy. That's not God using Putin. Okay? That's, I've seen so much stuff online. I mean, these last two weeks that I've been housebound. I make it through COVID. Two years of COVID. No isolation. <laughs> Come out of COVID. Two weeks isolation at home because of my eye off. And I'm looking at this and I'm seeing all the stuff online. And the people are teaching stuff. And they're pointing to the book of Ezekiel. And saying, but the rush is Russia. Folks, if you take a King James Bible, you will not find Russia in there. Russia does not feature in prophecy. The Middle East, you, you, the Middle East is where stuff is going to happen. And I'm just putting that in. This is just like a little snippet. So we have nothing to fear from that perspective. What is happening there is the brokenness of man and and it, it just shows you how things can happen in the world like that. And how people will be hoodwinked when the Antichrist does come on to the scene. And how easily man can be swayed. I look at that and I see, that's what I see. But in the book of Ezekiel, there are Bible versions that will bring in the word Rosh. But that's not in the, in, in, in the Textus Receptus, the received text. It's been added in. You see how subtly these things get added in and, and Satan wants to throw us off course. We've got to stick into God's word. But anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting off course now. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through to 2. Now, remember I said to you, you're looking at John. There, there, there the story is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's in Bethany the day before Palm Sunday. He's got Lazarus there. He's at this meal. He's putting everything on display. He has a verse that helps me understand what was going through the mind of the Lord, what he knew about. Let's put it that way. I cannot read the Lord's mind. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so cloud, great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Here's the verse. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his physicality, in his humanity, sweat drops of blood in the garden when he was praying. Physically, folks, he was in torment like you and I cannot believe. I mean, it is a known medical phenomenon that if, you, if you're un, under such duress and such stress, that, you, that is physically possible in heightened stress situations. And that was the Lord's physical manifest, uh, manifestation just days after this. So we, we understand that physically, that's what he went through. But as God, he looked ahead in time. He knew what he was going to accomplish. That's what the scripture says. And he says, despising the shame, despising the fact that he knew he was going to be beaten, he was going to be ill-treated, the very hairs. As a 30-year-old as a Jewish man, 
fulfilling the law. He had a beard. He wasn't clean shaven. He had a beard. They literally pulled those hairs out of him. Physical torment like you cannot believe. Emotional torment beyond measure. And spiritual anguish like nothing before. And yet, the scripture says, we look to Jesus. He's the author. He's the one that makes it possible for us to be saved, folks. He's the author and finisher of our faith. It's all in him. For my grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. None of us can stand here and say, I'm, I'm saved because of the work I do. No, no, we are saved because of our faith in Christ Jesus and his faithfulness. That's why we're talking to you this morning, the faithfulness of Christ. I mean, you understand that if any of us were there and we knew what we knew that Christ knew in our physicality, would you enter Jerusalem? Really? No. That's why his faithfulness, despising the shame, and he looked ahead in time. You know what he, you know, you know what he knew? That you would trust him. That there would be faithful who would trust him. That he would die for the sin of every man, every woman, but not all would faithfully trust him. But he looked ahead in time and he said, that's what I'm going to accomplish for you. That's because I love you. That's my love on display. And that's what the scriptures declare here. Go with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 12. And let's race on so that I can, I want to get through all these scriptures this morning. For those of you who know and who follow us online, you know that I don't always finish the scripture. I always give you more. That's, that's so that you can go and study it out yourself, and then we'll carry on next week. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. And we're going to just jump in here at verse 6 and 7. Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. The keeping is the preserving the word of God. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Folks, today, that's what we have. God's preserved word. But notice what I want you to see here. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace, as earth purified seven times. You can write next to that verse, Ezekiel 22, verse 18 and 19. I'm not going to turn there, but it talks about dross. The 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 dross of silver, you know, if, if you've got some silver at home on display and it doesn't get polished, what happens? Okay, so all your silver is shiny. <laughs> it loses color, right? It goes black. And if you really leave it for a long time, it goes really black. That's the dross. Okay, so... When it says silver purified seven times, when it's melted down and you, and you see that, what, what comes to the top? It's the impurity. And then they scoop that off and they take it off. And here it says it's purified seven times. So, you know, that, that's like really purified, really, really clean. Go with, me to, go with me to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Um, verse eight and nine i'm just jumping in here to some scriptures for time's sake but please read through the rest of these these readings in the psalms notice here psalm 69 um this is the psalm of david okay david is he's writing historically he's he's declaring things for himself but he's also writing prophetically so when you look at this here in Psalm 69, verse 8, I am become a stranger among, unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Well, he, he, you understand that even the Lord's family didn't all believe and trust in him. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. Go with me to John chapter 2. That's prophetic, right? Now, let's see what John chapter 2 tells us. The book of John chapter 2 and verse 13. 
And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and, and sheep and doves and changes of money. Now, this is before we're going a little bit before now Christ was preparing to be crucified. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, the sheep and the animals and, and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes of money and overthrew the tables. You understand what was happening was at that time, the Jews would come there and they would come to, to worship the Lord and they would want to give to, to the Lord and they come from different areas and they didn't have the, uh, the coinage of the day. So were there those folk that were saying, oh, we'll sell it to you. You know what they were doing? They were doing them in. They were making money out of this. And this is what the Lord's saying. You're making money out of these worshipers coming here. You're not doing fair trade. You ever threw the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. You understand what was happening there? These guys were making money out of those folks. And you know, I look at what's happening in the world today and I see those who should be there for those teaching the truth of God's word, making money out of people. I was looking, it just now in the news, there was some churches that the receiver of revenue had found millions and millions and millions of rands, how these guys had hidden some money and so forth. Anyway. And his disciples remembered that it is written, notice, that the zeal of thine house is eaten me up. What did I just read from you from Psalm 69? So they remembered the scriptures. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou dost these things? I mean, what authority have you got to come and tell us this? That's what they were saying. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now look at the blindness of these guys. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. You understand? When he said that, they didn't fully understand. The disciples didn't even understand. When he was raised, they remembered this. And he said unto them, and they believed the scripture, that the word which Jesus had said. Notice, they believed the scripture, Psalm 69, verse 9, and the word that Jesus had said. What was the Lord Jesus Christ? The living word. Thy word is pure. Thy word is trustworthy says the word of God. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed on his name when they saw that the miracle which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He knew, the, and he knew the hearts. And indeed, not that they should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So there, the Lord Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, he knows the heart of man. Final reading, Proverbs chapter 14. How's that time? Okay. We're going to end. I've been told I will make it. Okay. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Let's go to verse 25 for time's sake. Proverbs 20. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness, witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Folks, now I know this message is probably different to what you, were, you maybe have heard on previous Palm Sundays. But I hope and I, and I trust that the scripture that we've shown you, that you will see a depth an understanding of the power of the working of our Lord and Savior, the heart and the mind of our Lord and Savior, who loved you beyond measure, that was willing to do everything necessary to have you come to salvation. First, for the nation of Israel to be saved when they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, they rejected what he had accomplished 
God to the Apostle Paul brings in this message, whether we Jew or Gentile now, that we are saved by God's grace through faith. Our faith in Christ Jesus and what was accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary. You believe and trust that. You don't trust yourself. You trust what God did through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that Christ died on that cross for you. He paid for your sin. He was buried and he rose again. That he looked ahead in time. He despised the shame. And that he took upon himself the punishment that was due you and me. That's what we look at for this week coming up. And when we get together next week, Sunday, and as we continue to look at this and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior and the power and the working of Almighty God in and through that, that's what we focus on. That's what we look at. I want to leave you with one final thought, and this is something I'm just going to throw in. And that is that over these last two years with lockdown and so forth, I've been looking at a lot of stuff. And one of the things and the understandings I've come to in, in, in God's word is when it talks about the Lord instituting the Lord's Supper. He did that around a meal. And we talk about doing communion and or having the Lord's Supper. And honestly, folks, I've come to recognize, and I'm just going to put it in here, and this is not a teaching, it's my understanding, and we'll teach on this. Do you understand that when you as a family get together and you sit around with friends and family and you have a meal, and you focus on the truth of God's word and you celebrate, that's, I believe, is truly having and celebrating the Lord's Supper. Not a cracker and some juice that we have in church. We've taken what I believe the true meaning of the Lord's Supper to be. And we've brought it in so that we can do something religious. I want to challenge you. For you folk online listening to this and you folk here. As we lead up to Easter weekend. My challenge to you is this. Is in the week. We're leaving tomorrow. You'll have to do it tonight. <laughs> Have a meal. And as you have the meal, just give thanks that Christ Jesus gave himself. His body was broken. He shed his blood. And as you have that meal and have that juice, you remember that as a family. And you celebrate the true meaning of Easter. Can I leave that with you? We'll pick up on that next week. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that we can trust your word above all else. Your word, our final authority. We thank you accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary. And I pray anybody listening to this now online, here this morning, and after the event, that they would truly not trust what our words are, but trust your word and examine in your word of what we have said is true or not. We give you thanks. We give you praise by Christ Jesus. Amen.